Good morning, everyone, or, or afternoon if you're not on the West Coast. Um, I'm George Blumenthal. I'm the uh, director of the Center for Studies in Higher Education and the former chancellor of the University of California, Santa Cruz. And I'd like to welcome you to today's presentation. We're gonna be talking about the evolution of university systems, goals, strategies, obstacles, and achievements. You know, university systems are changing these days. We're seeing a consolidation, for example, motivated by efficiencies of scale. Many functions can be better handled through a system-wide central office than by individual campuses. And today you'll hear about three systems that have undergone significant evolution. Our we have three presenters today. Shelley Clark Nickel is a strategic policy advisor in leading state higher education systems and helps institutions plan and execute complex initiatives, including consolidations and enterprise-wide solutions. Her experience largely gained in Georgia, both in state government and as an executive of the University System of Georgia, now includes the Penn State University System. Her focus remains on providing students a pathway for successful completion of their higher education goals. Our second speaker is Kathy Sandine, recently, who recently assumed the presidency of Cal State East Bay. She held previous positions as chancellor at the University of Alaska Anchorage and as chancellor of the University of Wisconsin Colleges and UW Extension. She's also held leadership positions at three University of California campuses. And Kathy and I first met actually when I was the chancellor at UC Santa Cruz and she was a dean there. Dr. Sandine also served as vice president for education, educational attainment and, and innovation at the American Council of Edu on Education where she led ACE's nationwide effort to increase post-secondary educational attainment. She's returned to her roots as a native of the East Bay and a two-time alum of the California State University system now. And our third speaker, Dan Greenstein, is Chancellor of Penn State's System of Higher Education, a system with 14 public universities serving nearly 100,000 students. He previously led the post-secondary success strategy at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And prior to that, he was Vice Provost for Academic Planning and Programs for the University of California system. He holds both a bachelor's and master's degree from the University of Pennsylvania and a doctor of philosophy from the University of Oxford and remains an enthusiastic and devoted cyclist. I'm going to ask each of them to give a brief presentation, but before then I want to, em before then I want to emphasize for that for those of you observe, uh, viewing this on YouTube, you can use the chat function on YouTube to submit questions. And we'll be asking many of those questions at the end of their presentation. Some of you have already submitted questions and those are also in the mix for asking. So without further ado, let me turn it over to Shelly Clark Nickel and ask her to say a few words about systems. Good morning, everyone. Um, thank you, George. As George mentioned, I previously worked for the University System of Georgia and I'm presently, presently working with um, Dr. Greenstein, the chancellor of the Pennsylvania uh, System of Higher Education. So um, a different experience in both of them, but I'm gonna talk about Georgia this morning. Let me just start with the context. Um, the Board of Regents is a group of nine individuals selected, appointed by the governor of the state of Georgia. And their uh, mission is to set policy for the then in 2010, uh, 35 public higher education institutions throughout the state of Georgia. And their authority is, um, you know, they pretty much have the authority to govern as um, as they see fit, including the, the allocation of appropriated state tax dollars uh, from the General Assembly. So um, a lot of um, authority rests with the Board of Regents. And so they are um, the one body for all institutions um, in the system. Let me just describe a little bit um, what happened back in 2010. Um, 
there was a problem. And the problem was the cost of higher education in the state was continuing to rise. And the demographics were looking like um, in out years, enrollment was going to decline. So you had lines crossing at some point um, in the near future. When you look at the demographics of the state, um, there would be more and more students of diverse backgrounds entering or leaving, uh, leaving high school, our traditional pipeline in the university system. And they were not the students who were typically um, coming to higher education in Georgia. So how would we be able to get more students um, into that pipeline while we were looking at the overall decline in the number of students who were graduating from high school? In addition, as I mentioned, the costs were going up. We had continued to see enrollment increases um, in the early 2000s, built a lot more dormitories, climbing walls, lazy rivers, all those kind of things that students said they wanted, but it added to the cost of going to college. So here we were um, with a dilemma and also looking at the data of retention and graduation, we were a um, complete college America state and that um, data revealed that we weren't doing a great job in all of our institutions. So looking at that data, the demographics, the cost and the retention graduation rates that was presented to our board of regents and they determined that we needed to do something. Um, closing institutions was not something that they were interested in doing, but they looked across the 35 and determined that there were eight that were possible candidates for consolidation um, at that time. So we started off by consolidating um, eight of those institutions into four um, over the course of the next seven years we did consolidate um, nine institutions and the system is now um, made up of 26 institutions um, rather than 35. So I'll leave it there, George, and um, we can talk later on about what happened. Okay, that sounds great. So let's now turn to Kathy Sandine. Kathy? Sure, thank you. Um, and hello everyone, it's a pleasure to be here today. So I come at this from a little bit different perspective because I've never worked in a system office per se, but I've been a chancellor or president in um, several systems. And the two I'm gonna talk about today are University of Wisconsin system and University of Alaska system. And I think the, the University system of Georgia really was the first to go all in on this issue of um, consolidation and coping with the fact that you have multiple institutions spread throughout a state when demographics are, are against you. So I both participated in a, um, a, a consolidation. And um, so I'll talk about that. But first, uh, a little bit about the context of the University of Wisconsin system. Again, major respected public university system in our country. I was proud to have been part of it. The Wisconsin system currently has 13 universities and 26 separate campuses. It is a multi-sector system, meaning it's, you know, they have 11 um, regional comprehensive universities and um, two research universities. And then when I was there, they had two small two-year community campuses as well. Like Georgia, it's overseen by a single board of regents, members of which are appointed by the governor. Um, I, it's important to point out that in Wisconsin, there's also a separate technical college system for career and technical education. And there are 16 campuses in 50 locations. So that, in addition, there's some very fine uh, private universities and colleges in the state of Wisconsin. The population of Wisconsin is 5.8 million and um, also projecting a decrease in college going age population. So a lot of pressures, uh, state government at the time that was um, reducing investment in public higher education. So there was a lot and a lot of intrastate competition. I was there from 2014 to 2018. And as 
um, George said, I was the chancellor or the chief executive of two institutions within the system. Both were statewide. One was University of Wisconsin Colleges, 13 two-year transfer institutions spread throughout the state. The largest had 2,000 students, the smallest had 300 students, some in very, very small communities. Um, we also had UW colleges online. So at, at the time when I arrived, each of these small colleges had a full um, administrative um, uh, unit. So everybody has a, everyone had a director of IT, director of library, director of this, director of that, regardless of the size. So the consolidation that I was able to do, and I was able to do this with consultation in the board, it didn't require approval because it was within my institution was to consolidate, regionalize, and centralize um, most of the administrative functions of those colleges. And we were able to reduce our budget by 25% by doing that, but more importantly, streamlining our operations because we had more um, uh, you know, consolidated operations that made sense. So since I departed from Wisconsin, they did an additional consolidation where they took those two-year colleges and consolidated them with the nearest four-year university without decreasing costs. So um, I'm not sure how, how that, that uh, worked. I understand that there's still the demographic problems and financial problems in the system, but I did oversee my own consolidation so I can talk about that in the Q&A. And also from 2018 to tw uh, 2021, I was a chancellor, again, the head of a university in the University of Alaska system. So much smaller, it's three accredited universities and 19 separate campuses overseen by a board of regents. It's a multi-sector um, uh, system and it also includes community colleges. So as chancellor of University of Alaska um, uh, Anchorage, I oversaw a college of community and technical education. So the full specter within one university. Um, the, some of the campuses are very, very rural, you know, in small villages that are off the road system. So you can't get there by car. You either have to fly, take a boat or a snow machine, snow machine to get there. So when you talk about Alaska and rural, it really, I think defines the category. The population of Alaska is um, 732,000 people, and these are spread over an area one-fifth of the size of the continental United States. And that state also was suffering demographic declines in terms of college going um, age population and, um, and also budget cuts. So in 2019, the summer of 2019, there was a top-down decision made by the system head to consolidate all of the universities under one accreditation. There was a lot of press in Chronicle of Higher Education, Inside Higher Education at the time. Um, ultimately, that decision was reversed by the Board of Regents and it remains three different consolidations. So I've seen a lot of consolidating in systems. Some are successful, some are not. Some of the, the uh, elements that lead to success would be pretty well-documented external um, forces and trends. And I think that was true in Georgia as well. I think having um, the support of your board, uh, uh, a lot of consultation, good data to support it, making a decision ultimately and carrying that through. And do not forget the human element. These are important institutions and they affect people's lives. And the points of failure are, are kind of the opposite of the points of success, but other factors that enter in the difficulty or um, ease of a major consolidation of a system would be the um, presence or strength of collective bargaining units, as well as the relationship with shared governance of the faculty. So I'll stop there. That's just a little bit about my experience and I look forward to the Q&A. Great, thank you so much, Kathy. Now let me turn to Dan to talk about Great. Penn State. Thank you. Um, so, uh, and we're going in chronological order. So I think uh, Georgia was first out of the gate followed by Wisconsin, uh, Alaska, and then uh, Pennsylvania were still in the throes of the planning aspects. So Pennsylvania State System of Higher Education, 14 universities, um, uh, the state's public university uh, uh, sector. Most of them are, uh, are um, teaching to the MA level. We have one research university. 
Uh, so there's reasonably heterogeneous or homogeneous. Um, uh, very important. I mean, they, to, to, to Kathy's point about you know uh, 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 rural schools, there they are all of them, or certainly yeah, all of them are really stewards of place in the uh, in in the phrase that um, <clears throat> that that uh, Askew uh, developed. Um, they they are important employers in their region. They are the lifebloods of their communities. Um, they create jobs, but they also build that sort of next generation of business and education and healthcare leaders that communities need to sort of thrive. So vital in that regard. And they and they have a lot of history. I think our youngest is 120 something, and our oldest is 180 something. Um, our board is politically appointed, 20 members. Uh, the political appointments run to uh, all branches of government, the, uh, the, uh, the, the House and Senate and the General Assembly and, and the administration. Um, there are, um, uh, bo uh, both parties have um, uh, designated uh, rep uh, representation as well. And so it's a, it's, it's a politically appointed board. Um, it has most of the usual authorities, um, policy, uh, oversight, um, uh, budgetary uh, authority, ask for money from the state, distribute it formulaically to universities. One authority did not have was to change the corporate structure and uh, which integration or consolidation would entail. And so that authority had to be acquired through uh, legislative action. And that, that happened last year and sort of kickstarted the, the planning process that we're in. Um, I guess the rationale very similar to uh, some of the issues that have already been raised, you know, Pennsylvania, um, you've seen sort of continued divestment of uh, public dollars from, from higher education. Pennsylvania is 47th in the nation with respect to funding for public higher education. Um, uh, and of course, this sort of uh, state divestment continues, uh, forces tuition uh, increases in tuition fees, room and board on students. And then that begins to sort of drive enrollment decline. Um, enrollments are hard to get anyway, given the demographic trends in Pennsylvania as elsewhere across the country. Um, and it's a very crowded, as Wisconsin, it's a very crowded marketplace uh, in Pennsylvania. Uh, it's where, where enrollments are hard to get. So we have seen our enrollments drop uh, by about 21% in the last 10 years. We're at a level that we were at in 2000. Uh, but in 2000, the state picked up 700 million uh, in annual uh, contribution and inflation adjusted dollars. We're currently at about 480 million. So our financial circumstances are very different now than they were then. Um, and, and of course, all of this shows up in the finances of our universities, uh, the low enrolled, lower enrolled schools, you know, in, in particular, struggling very um, significantly because their enrollments don't meet the, their costs of uh, operations, with, either on the auxiliary side or on the uh, E&G, the general operations budget side. Um, and that's problematic in two ways. It's problematic for the university, which is trying to sustain itself and sustain the great work it does for its students and its communities. But it's also problematic for the system because we're a single corporate structure, a single bank account financial weakness in one university tugs everywhere across the system. The system's other universities are responsible through various kinds of cross subsidies and loan funding to basically help shore up, the, to, to shore up and not help to shore up the, the financially challenged ones. So that's, that's a problem. I think there's an additional level of challenge that we're trying to address. And it really is a challenge of low enrolled schools uh, generally that are experiencing this kind of um, uh, 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 decline is, you know, inevitably what happens is as enrollment shrink, eventually universities and colleges have to get around to adjusting their academic program array. So their, their, their revenues align with their expenditures. And of course, as that happens, as you compress the program array, you know, it has further downward pressure on enrollments. And so integration really is a, is a way to address several of these challenges simultaneously, at least that's the way it's conceived in, Pencil in Pennsylvania, is how do you provide traditional students uh, with the kind of quality education that they, they're getting. And um, uh, it, historically at our universities, um, uh, how do you enable that opportunity, but at the same time to provide the program breadth that both the students and the surrounding communities need? I mean, it's never lost on me the fact that, you know, a lot of our universities are responsible for providing healthcare and education professionals and business professionals into their local regions. Those regions don't just require a single flavor of healthcare professional, they require the full menu. And, and of course that's hard to sustain with enrollments that are shrinking, you know, five, four, three and smaller thousand uh, numbers of students. So uh, through, through um, uh, integration, there's an opportunity to combine program breadth with uh, the quality of the residential experience. Very much like Georgia, everything that we have done, uh, very kind of data-driven analysis, uh, really focused on improving the outcomes for our students, you know, improving access, affordability, and increasingly also focused on, you know, how do you improve outcomes, not just for some students, but for all students. Um, and so, you know, we're still again in a planning phase, 
But it's interesting to me how the planning process has opened up an opportunity to address some of these really significant performance issues that higher education you know, faces uh, cro uh, across the nation independently of some of the financial challenges that they, they might be facing. So let me leave it there and look forward to questions. Thank you. Great, thank you, Dan. Well, thank you all. Um, this is really interesting. You'll notice we have three speakers all, of ta all talking about consolidating systems. We don't have anyone talking about blowing up systems because that isn't really happening right now. But I would like to ask each of you, and some of you have talked about this a little bit already, but I'd like to ask each of you to talk about the major challenges and opportunities that you saw as your systems consolidated. So Kathy, can we start with you? Sure, thank you, happy to do that. So the, I'll start with the challenges. The challenges, again, were touched on both by Shelley and by, by Dan and the importance of these smaller institutions within their communities. So any change is met with great fear and resistance. And, and so um, working constructively to the best you can, you know, so you're making difficult decisions, you're not going to make everybody happy, but um, paying attention to the context of those smaller universities is important and it is a huge challenge. Um, as Dan said, you know, how do you pro provide um, the full array of what a community needs within, um, you know, a very small institution. And I think some of the opportunities or the successes are integrating some online education in a smart way. Like we don't wanna take a, a, a small college and turn it into an online college. That's not the point, but you can increase the breadth of your offerings by having a combination of in-person and online. And the big successes I think are in streamlining workflows and administrative functions. And by having, um, we did the regions in the University of Wisconsin colleges. So there were three or four colleges in, with a regional administration. And there was much more opportunity for um, breaking down the silos between the institutions and sharing knowledge um, across. So uh, not only do you save money, I mean, that is the principal impetus for it, but I think that there's a lot of benefits that you can get from these sorts of consolidations. Great, thank you. Uh, Shelley, do you have anything? I'll just add to what Kathy said and say that the, the biggest opportunity I saw was really being able to design a new university, thinking of it from the side of, a stu of students, from student success, rather than thinking about you know, what the institution itself needs, what do students need, and really ripping apart all those bureaucratic ways we have been doing things and making the process for getting into college easier and getting out of college with a degree easier. Um, not in terms of quality, but in the administrative ways that we have put up barriers for students. So that to me is the biggest opportunity. The challenge, and Kathy touched on this, is change is hard. Change is really hard. And you're dealing with people. And these are people's jobs, their livelihoods. And that is, you have to always have that in the back of your mind that you're not just doing this for the heck of it. You're doing it to make it better for students, but in the path, you are disturbing the way things have been for a very long time. And that in turn makes people really nervous. They wanna know if they're gonna land somewhere on an org chart. And that's what they're thinking of from the moment this is, is brought um, up. And so you have to you know, try to manage that process to the best of your ability, so. Yeah, and I guess I, I build on both of those comments to just uh, another dimension, uh, but along the same lines, you know, on the opportunities uh, side uh, to, to really design for the students of the future, rather than to try to shoehorn students into our constructs, think about what our constructs ought to be for them. Um, we took a, a very devolved approach to planning, you know, and again, partly reflection of the fact that our, our universities are very 
old, they're, they have a lot of legacy history, tradition, um, exceptionally important places. So, you know, through the, we, we developed a planning process, of, you know, where we've got something like 215 working groups and subgroups working on various aspects. You know, every group is tied to a particular function of the university. And we basically ask them to talk about, okay, well, what, what could you become in a number of years? And then what needs to be done on opening day, assuming opening day is uh, August, 2022. And then, you know, what are the priorities to get to, to, to move in those directions? Um, but those 215 working groups involve something like a thousand people across across the six universities that are being you know considered for in two different consolidations. And you know, I remember launching them back in October, and you know, there was a slide that we we put up because we realized what we were asking people to do. And and um, the slide I think said something like, you know, be courageous. Um, uh, because again, to the emotional aspect, th these are people who are working during the course of a pandemic you know, uh, being asked to design a whole new university while running one um, or, or participating in, a, in, in running one in, in various different roles or being a student in one um, and try to find some joy in the opportunity to reimagine what higher education ought to be ought to become. And I, I, my hat's off to the uh, those people. They took the opportunity to do some of the most tremendous uh, aspirational and analytically driven work. I think on the just on the uh, the challenge path, I think, you know, we've talked about the emotional aspect and it's really important to cater to that. I think, or, and, and to embrace it and to be empathetic. I think the other, and supportive, I think the other is it really requires us to be transparent about what are very uncomfortable truths. I mean, you know, nobody does this because it's fun. I, I, at least I don't, I'm not yet aware of anybody or even because they want to. It is, it is driven by a series of, of, of policy choices in the public sector, uh, which have resulted in you know, ongoing divestment. Uh, it is driven by demographic trends. It is driven by sort of cost structures that are, you know, exist at the macro level that force, you know, if you're really thinking about the student and the student of the future and pursuing our mission of affordable quality pathways into and beyond the middle class, this is a path to ensure that future. Um, uh, and that requires just sort of taking the top off the book and opening it up. And those aren't fun conversations because on the whole, people have no idea how challenged we have become, not just in Pennsylvania, but as, 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 as a sector. And it's, it's, it's that it's the dirty little secret nobody wants to talk about. And yet here we are. Yeah, Dan, I think you're absolutely right about the dirty little secret. Public higher education, which produces, by the way, 70% of all bachelor's degrees in the country, is across all 50 states financially challenged these days. Now, you've all alluded to what, what were the challenges, but did, did any of you have specific opposition groups that were strongly opposed to consolidation? And, and if so, how did you deal with them? Was that the case for any of you? Stop laughing, Shelley. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll, I'll give another example from my time in Wisconsin. So in addition to the consolidation of the University of Wisconsin colleges, I also oversaw University of Wisconsin, Wisconsin Extension, which included cooperative extension. So this is a beloved program began um, bringing science to the agricultural industry, but of course has many other program areas now. In Wisconsin, we had offices in 72 counties and four tribal nations. And similarly, we had a director in every single one, regardless of size and, and a lot of administrative overhead. Um, and so I did a consolidation there too, where we, we consolidated into areas. Um, I think there are something like over a thousand county elected officials in the state of Wisconsin. And so I basically had to meet with every single one of them, you know, in groups in order to explain what we were trying to do to get them on board and to um, help them see that there could be a positive outcome. You know, they, they're partial funders of these offices. Um, and uh, so they have a lot of of investment uh, emotionally and otherwise. So that those were groups that really could have stopped the consolidation, but fortunately because of our consultation and the data we were able to share, we were able to move that forward. So right. elected officials, I think can be big opposition. Interesting. Uh, Anyone uh, else? 
Go ahead, Shelley. I'll just add that um, in our case, um, it was pretty prevalent that one institution was the dominant one and another one was the lesser um, because of enrollments or whatever. And that dominance pervaded the consolidation in ways that um, sometimes were ugly, you know, just we're better than you kind of thing. And why would we want to be you to be part of us? We have this brand that is a lot better than what you are. And um, that that was really um, unnerving, I guess. And um, I had the opportunity to be the interim president of one of the recently consolidated institutions where that was very, um, very obvious that, um, you know, faculty members, um, staff members all thought that their institution of this larger institution was um, a, a more quality institution than the other one. And that became a barrier um, up and down in every single way to making these two groups not think of themselves, but think of their students as a collective uh, student body. So um, I would say that was a, a big barrier. And the other one I'll mention, um, this is the, the South and towns play each other in football on Friday nights. And I had one man call me up one night and say, I don't wanna be, <laughs> a warrior. I'm a tiger. And this is, you know, it was so it was very personal to people. It was the next town over and they didn't really want to be part of that town. So um, I, I think, you know, those kind of things take time to heal. Um, and it is, you know, we are 10 years out now. So um, those institutions aren't what they used to be. And in every case in Georgia, there were instances where the names had changed and evolved over time in the history of that institution. This is just another piece of history. And that was what we were trying to instill in people. Nobody wanted to hear that, of course, but that is, it's an evolution of higher education. It doesn't, just because it is what it is today, doesn't mean it's going to stay that way in the future. So just a little bit of, of our experience. And it's interesting, you know, there are different models of consolidation that are sort of represented here. It's probably worth being um, clear about some of the differences. So the model that uh, Georgia pursued was institutions would come together and form something distinctive and new with a new name. In Pennsylvania, we're, the path we're pursuing with uh, our creditor is that institutions come together as a single part of a single accredited entity, but each of the comp component participating institutions remain maintain their names, brands, identity, you know, and use them in uh, in all the usual ways. Uh, the path we're pursuing with the NCAA uh, would permit our universities to maintain their teams. Um, so so it really is trying to, and, and I think it's reflective of the fact that, you know, again, there's a lot of history and that um, uh, here and 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 the richness in that, and, and strength in that diversity, uh, um, which is um, worth, maintaining. So, uh, so that's a, it's a sort of a, a different approach. One of the, um, uh, I'll go to the, um, I'll try to remain the, uh, uh, you know, the, on the optimistic side, one of the most uh, rewarding things I've observed in, in, um, is how councils of trustees, each of our universities has a, a politically appointed kind of oversight group, council of trustees, how the councils of trustees in the two regions have reached out to one another. Um, and their members are beginning to, to, to learn from one another. The student leaders are reaching out to one another. You know, some of the faculty are reaching out to one another to begin to have those conversations. You know, and, it, and, and again, it goes back to that emotional component. These are not just people. They're people that are a part of very distinctive cultures, organizational cultures, and they're different. And, and you know, it, it, these aren't just like Lego blocks that we can just put together in new ways, right? You're, we're, 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 it is a, it is a, it's a cultural journey that we're on um, uh, and, 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 you know, again, sort of trying to create the time and the space to recognize that, you know, in the working groups and Shelly has been uh, actually probably more sleeves rolled up in the working groups than, than I have been to actually make time for people to, to, to have that, to make that journey to, to actually to grieve, um, and then to find yeah. strength in something new. You, to, to, to be mindful of that. And it's hard, you know, because we're all trying to get stuff done and there's 
timelines and there's board pressures and there's, you know, the legal environment, and the legislative, I mean, environment and all these other things that are going on. But to be sensitive to the fact that, um, you know, these are, we're involved in an evolution of more than just structure and practice and process. Great. Super. Well, along those lines, I mean, one issue is this almost the psychological issue, which I know many systems grapple with. I, and I'd be interested in each of your thoughts on this, is whether or not when you have a system, you should think of the system as one university with several different manifestations, or whether you should think of the system as a group of independent universities or a loose confederation of universities that happen to be tied together by certain bonds. And uh, that difference can be important. And that difference isn't necessarily set in, set in stone. It can change with differing leadership or differing boards. But I'd be interested in each of your thoughts on that. Maybe Dan, I'll turn to you first. Do you have thoughts? Yeah, I do. I mean, I, and I think you'll find that there are differences by system. It won't surprise me. I think, you know, the key learning for me was to recognize that because of that financial interdependence, that accountabilities that are typically apparent in systems, university presidents are accountable to the chancellor and the board in some way, that actually more important than that accountability or as important of that vertical accountability is the horizontal one. And, you know, because, because financial weakness and strength anywhere in the system tugs everywhere in the system, uh, uh, a program approval, uh, which is something that's available to the board or a funding distribution, something that's available to the board, uh, can have a ripple can have ripple effects, you know, depending on uh, how those decisions are made. That that level of interdependence, we we had to find a way to govern in a way that accommodated that interdependence. And so, you know, actually, I, hats off to my presidents who really helped me as sort of a new chancellor. I really identify that need, um, and to really help us together recognize that we are co-investors in one another, and that we need to manage together as system leaders. And so, you know, we formed this construct of uh, executive leadership groups. Basically, I, I think of it as my cabinet with the presidents. And then we have our sort of subordinate groups, vice chancellors of various different functions um, who and, and, and a faculty council who work with us so that um, anything that we're attempting, whether it's integration or a shared service or a new budget allocation model grows up through that group because the implications are felt differently across that group. And so this notion that, you know, as a president, we want you to be the best CEO you can be, but we also need you to invest in the success of each other and each other's institutions. I think to me, that has been the biggest uh, major shift in, in, in at least thinking about how a system should be um, uh, uh, led, I guess, yeah. Great, thank you. Uh, Shelly, do you have thoughts? On um, I, yeah, and I, I, I've seen, um, in, in Georgia, the, um, the board, it appears to me, this is an observation, is very mindful of making sure that the system as a whole is providing academic um, programs that are appropriate for the state of Georgia as a whole. And therefore, individual institutions play different roles. So mission, institutional mission is very, very important. And it is something that is determined um, and set by the board. So mission change, um, which, you know, we had a lot of institutions that wanted to grow. And in that growing, they were, um, I would call it mission creeping, but you know, trying to be that next best thing in terms of growing from a two-year campus into you know providing a number of four-year degrees, et cetera, et cetera. Um, everybody wants to be at that next level because they think that provides more prestige and more branding and more opportunity. But what the board has taken um, the role of you know, let's make sure that you're the best at what you are serving now before you start to think about moving to that next level. And that has taken some harnessing. I mean, it's not an easy thing to do when somebody has an aspirational goal of providing doctoral programs um, when they really should only be doing bac baccalaureate programming. Um, it's really difficult. So I think that is you know, the, the push and pull of um, 
and you know, it's it's very it can get very personal. The the board members are um, attached to some of these institutions as alums or whatever, and um, so it you know it's very interesting to watch um, as an observer. Um, being in the thick of things isn't always that much fun. <laughs> Great. Kathy, do you want to add anything? Confederacy versus one university? It, it, exactly. So, you know, I, you, you share my experience as being the head of an individual institution within a system. And there is always that push and pull between centralization and decentralization. I, I think um, every place I've been, every single state, including California, regional differences are very important. You know, and, and a university, number one, I think you see it's a little different. You're all big international universities, but at the comprehensive level, we're really serving our, our regions. The majority of students come from our regions. Our, the majority of them work for employers in our regions. And it's very different. If you think about Bakersfield versus East Bay, very different regions. So maintaining those um, regional differences, I think is important. But I also really um, respect the economies of scale and support that I get from the system. I mean, think about it. If we all had to hire our own lobbyists, if we all hired, ha had to get our own insurance, our risk pool, our you know, general counsel, the expense would be tremendous. And um, so I see a lot of benefit from a system. Uh -huh. and, the current system I'm, I'm privileged to be part of California University, California State University system, uh, largest in the country, almost half a million students, half of the graduates bachelor completions in the state of California come from our system. Just that little plug. But we also have system wide goals that are set by our, our board and our chancellor. For example, we have one called graduation initiative 2025 which is really um, giving us additional resources and support to increase the graduation rate. So I see a lot of benefits in the system, but I also see benefits in maintaining that uh, regional individuality and service. Great, thank you. Well, since speaking of California, one of the questions that was sent in concerns California to ask what kind, what kind of consolidations might be possible in California and you foresee opportunities to create efficiencies and strengthen academic pathways across the systems in California. So um, California, for those of you not from California in the audience, uh, has three major systems. The University of California system, which is a research university, uh, the California State University, one of whose campuses Kathy leads, which, is, which provides uh, bachelor's and master's degrees for students, and then a system of community colleges, California community colleges. And maybe I can take a quick start at that answer and then turn, maybe Kathy would like to add, add some more in terms of opportunity. But I see two major academic opportunities. One is to improve the transfer rate between community colleges and both the CSU system and the UC system. A lot of progress has been made over the last few years, but frankly, not enough progress. And I think there's a huge room for transparency in terms of credits received, courses that you need in order to transfer, et cetera, that could be done by, by being more transparent by, through all of those systems. So I think there's still a lot of progress to be made. The other is in terms of joint degrees. There's nothing that prevents uh, any of those systems from all, or campuses from any of those systems from offering joint degrees with nearby campuses. Some have done that effectively. UC San Diego and San, San Diego State University for example, have a number of joint PhD programs. Uh, but I don't think that that's an opportunity that has really been taken up adequately across the various systems. And I think there's real opportunities there. Kathy, you may, you may wanna add something to that. I, I, I don't know. I think you did an excellent job. And, and so there is a lot of work at the um, seamless pathways between the community colleges and the four-year universities. And, um, a lot more work needs to be done in order to make those, those seamless, but that's been a real focus. And there has been some discussion about um, uh, at the legislature that I've heard recently about uh, common application for all, all of the sectors 
and then a com common uh, learning management system across all of the sectors. Now, those are huge, huge things to accomplish, but I think it does speak to the desire to make things a little more permeable. We have, when you think about the the um, California Master Plan for Higher Education, it has been pretty siloed since since the beginning. And now we're realizing we need permeable boundaries and uh, there's a lot of hard work that needs to happen, but I'm all for it. I completely agree. Thank you, Kathy. Um, let me ask a slightly more contentious question. And let me preface this by saying, by saying I'm asking this question as a former chair of the University of California system academic senate. And that is, is there a role for a system-wide senate in terms of shared governance within a university system? So I can I can start if you like, George. You know, one of the things that I discovered in uh, California and California and Pennsylvania when I started there was that there was we did not have the structure that I was used to and grew to love in uh, in in uh, in California. Um, you know, we have a, a, our a faculty organized into a collective bargaining unit, and you know, obviously there's a lot of structure around the way we interact, and that's all good. But there wasn't the opportunity that we had in California to go and discuss, um, you know, with a, a faculty group to gain input in a way that on, on, on issues that weren't contractual. So a great example has already come up. Um, you know, uh, uh, universities would to, to sort of come up with new program ideas, and we would evaluate them at the system level. Typically, the uh, chief academic officers and sometime the presidents to make sure that those interdependencies were positive, not negative, right? But you know, all those programs came up through the work largely of faculty. And then by the time they got to the system level, there was there's nothing there. So um, you know, through the leadership of our board chair, Cindy Shapira, um, uh, put together a commission of the board to create a faculty council, um, which you know really begins to sort of act as, you know, um, uh, in, in a Senate-like way, um, they, they, they made their first set of recommendations. Uh, they just got formed a, a few months ago, I guess, made their first set of recommendations. And I, and I was just so so excited on, on, on issues that you really want a Senate to or a faculty council to lean in on, and including diversity, equity, inclusion, and, 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 and other, uh, you know, other, other issues. So um, it's a new construct, oddly enough, in Pennsylvania, but a super powerful one. I have a lot of uh, hope for it. I do want to give a plug last uh, thought, just as I mentioned it. Um, we were talking about uh, challenges and opportunities. Um, and I did want to mention the board. Um, and I think Kathy mentioned the board and the, bo the board, the, actually boards, the board chair, uh, legislative leadership and the governor and the governor's office, you know, uh, that combination gets their sleeves rolled up around public higher education, things can happen. Uh, we've actually benefited from that uh, in Pennsylvania, I think. Um, uh, you know, these are tough issues, especially in a swing state, but, you know, I think leaders typically understand that the situation is no longer tenable in the way that so we have to do something. Uh, and the board and the board chair in particular have just been tremendous. You know, I see them as thought partners and, and, and um, uh, sort of a strategist and you know, almost you know, part of it. The, they are part of the team uh, as much as you know, sort of my, my bosses. So that's, I, it's critical and it's, I'm not sure you can make those things happen. I'm not sure you can engineer that, uh, but um, it's a critical contributor. Great. Yeah, good point. And in terms of shared governance, it is absolutely a fundamental and critical pillar of US higher education and one that I completely embrace and respect. And so any major decision, especially those that touch on the academic operations of the university, the, the Senate is part of that conversation. And whether it be the local Senate at the local university in conjunction with a system-wide Senate, I think those are key partners in any any initiative of this type. Great, thank you. Shelly, do you wanna add anything? No, I think they've, they've covered it, thank Great. you. Great, super. Well, since we're talking about consolidating, uh, one of the things I've noticed as I've looked at systems around the country is how they treat collective bargaining. In some university systems, collective bargaining takes place on campuses. So each individual campus comes up with its own collective bargaining agreement uh, with the unions that operate on the campus, whether they be faculty uni unions or staff unions. On, in other systems, the University of California being an example, um, collective bargaining is largely done at the system-wide level. 
um, uh, which system do you, which, which approach do you think is more appropriate and what is your experience with them that you'd like to share? I'll go first. Um, so I've only worked in an environment where the collective bargaining agreements were negotiated at the system level. So a single agreement for all uh, employees in that category across the system. And sometimes the agreement that's made at the system level um, may not seem exactly appropriate for the local context, but I think the benefits of that larger collective body far outweigh what would happen if we had, um, you know, multiple bargaining units. Great. Anyone else want to weigh in? I can, I can, I can, let me weigh in. I mean, you know, I, there, so there's puts and takes, right? I think the, 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 the advantages are definitely efficiency, you know, and, and here I, Pennsylvania is a, done at the state level as in California. Um, uh, and it's a lot of work, so as we all know, and it, you know, and and it can depending on the scope of the the bargaining, it can be a lot of work. Um, at the same time, it then tends to sort of um, result in uh, scales that are common across the state. I just did a quick look at the uh, household county average household county income. Uh, sorry, average household income in Pennsylvania by county, and the range is from thirty four to just south of 100. So you have a single pay scale, you know, in the Philadelphia area, faculty on that pay scale are probably, you know, competitive more or less with the Philadelphia region. You move into a very rural area and, and now you're getting into a place where you're also talking about lower enrolled schools often that have these some financial challenges. So. Um, so I think you've got to weigh the advantages of the efficiency and the same, frankly, the single faculty, which is also, I think that that is extremely important in the success of University of California. And I would say arguably here in Pennsylvania, at the same time, the disadvantages in a state, which is such a diverse economy, um, there are significant uh, uh, financial challenges that are introduced. Great. So, um... We've talked a little bit about boards and governance boards, which often have different names for university systems. Um, but in each of your cases, you, you each report to a single governance board. Um, there have been proposals that I've seen over the years that suggest that it would be, it, would, it might be advantageous to, for individual campuses to have their own boards, either uh, an independent board or a board that's subservient to the board that, that uh, oversees the entire system. Do, do you have thoughts about that, the advantages and disadvantages of, of such a system of uh, boards? I, I certainly do. I, I think um, having one board, in terms of being able to implement a public policy for higher education um, in a meaningful way that has an impact on the economy of the state and other aspects of um, where you know, a state is trying to move itself um, is, is essential. So I'm, I'm probably more, would lean more toward a, I definitely would lean more toward centralization of a board. I, I think it's easier to be able to view from a system level, um, all of the issues that are confounding a around a problem and then try to find solutions. Now, those solutions um, can't always be one size fits all. That's the problem we get into in systems that, you know, you, you see a problem and you say, you gotta, you know, fit into this mold in order to move the ball down the road. That's not, that's not how I view um, solutions, but I do see definite value in having one voice for the system in terms of dealing with the General Assembly and the governor's office and um, being able to speak with one voice um, on, in terms of where public higher education is headed for the future of the citizens of that state. Great, that's a really clear answer. Um, Kathy or Dan, do you wanna add anything? Um, I, I agree with Shelley. I think the um, 
one voice with the legislature and the governor is really important. If you could imagine, you know, all these different institutions in Sacramento in her case, or, you know, Juno in the case of Alaska. Um, at the same time, when I was in Alaska, um, I oversaw, as, as you mentioned, University of Alaska Anchorage, which is a urban metropolitan high access um, regional comprehensive university in the largest city in the state, the largest university with the largest enrollment, but yet um, there was a feeling that the board was more focused on the research university in the center of the state and many policies left uh, University of Alaska, um, you know, kind of in the dust. Now I stayed out of it as chancellor, uh, but there was a movement among faculty and some business leaders and some elected officials in the Anchorage area to separate out the university from the system to make it Alaska State University and to have a separate board. Now that, that didn't happen, you know, and I, I wasn't pushing for that, but you know, this, this sort of, um, you know, kind of uh, dynamic can occur sometimes if a uh, unified system is not perceived as taking care of all the various institutions in the system. Yeah, I would, I would just add, George, you'll be familiar with this. Um, you know, I think it was 2006 that the University of California had a long range guidance committee uh, of the board, which published a report called the Power and Promise of 10, uh, which really spoke to the leverage available through system, through systemists. Uh, I think what we're discovering is that there's also negative leverage that can be encountered through systemness. And I don't think, you know, it's a bit like the Federalist Papers, right? The balance of power between the state and the Fed. I, I, I don't think that that's a static thing, but I think as economies uh, are challenged, I think as states, uh, you know, make policy choices, which undervalue, in my view, uh, public education, uh, uh, I think as demographics become more challenging, I think that negative leverage shows up more. Uh, the potential for that negative leverage is to show up more. Um, and I think this is actually forces some of the difficult questions that all of the university systems represented here have found themselves having, having to address is, is you know, how, how do you actually sort of achieve the sort of leverage points? And again, and this is something we learned from, from Shelley, you know, and her involvement in the work in Pennsylvania to, to focus is exclusively on the student, right? Just put everything through a student lens. You know, how do you sort of uh, emphasize that the leverage and sort of try to address the issues of negative leverage, which are real. So let me return to an issue that Kathy raised earlier, uh, which is online learning. Um, uh, is The real question is, it, it's clear that online learning is going to remain a part of university curricula into the future to some extent, and people debate how much. But the question is, what is the role of centralizing online learning in the university system, as opposed to letting each campus do its own thing and, repro and, and reproduce online courses among the various campuses within a system? Well, that's an age old question, isn't it? <laughs> I, I would say um, one of the things that, um, what I saw in Georgia was always trying to leverage the, um, the ability to use the system to its fullest. So trying to get every ounce of energy out of faculty and staff and the, um, the infrastructure that the system had to build something um, that is better than doing it by yourself. Now that falls apart when you have, um, you know, institutions like Georgia Tech, um, like the University of Georgia, who are have experts in particular fields and are really eons above many of the uh, other institutions. So, I I would say that there are some areas where. Um, English 101 can be taught at a system level um, or at not the system level by faculty from an institution, but managed system wide. Um, and, and then there are those other um, biotechnical um, courses or cybersecurity or things of that nature that are really um, 
specialties that really should be done perhaps at a, um, a research university. So uh, I'd say there's um, advantages in, uh, to both. I think one place where it can work um, is where you have academic programs that historically have low demand. So think about higher levels of certain um, languages, for example, where once someone gets up into the third or fourth year, those classes become very small. But And, and you can teach a foreign language effectively online. Um, so you could do something across a whole system with a few students from multiple institutions and create an actual you know, course that's viable. So looking at it from that perspective, I think would have a lot of buy-in. It's interesting about online. Um, I, I read studies several times that individuals, even though they have access to brand name universities around the country, when they're enrolling in an online degree program will tend to select the one closest to them a brand that they recognize, the regional brand. So it's kind of interesting when we talk about these um, structural issues, we have to go back to what Shelley said and originally focus on the students. You know, where are they? Where do they, what do they need? I think there are economies of scale in terms of technology platforms, but teaching an online course where it's high level of instructor interaction, an individual course section, is not less expensive necessarily taught online. So uh, thinking that, oh, we're gonna save a lot of money if we do it at a system is not necessarily true. Okay. Dan, do you want the last word on this? No, I was good, I, I, I ditto. <laughs> okay, great, thank you. Well, unfortunately, this has been really a fascinating discuss, discussion and unfortunately we are out of time. So I really wanna thank uh, all of you, Kathy, Shelly and Dan for participating. And to those of you out there, I wanna thank you for joining us. And I wanna just mention that the Center for Studies in Higher Education uh, puts on a robust lecture series. Our next lecture will be on uh, an open systems approach to the future of US universities with Steve Brint from uh, uh, Riverside, uh, Roger Geiger from uh, Penn State University and uh, Francisco Ramirez from Stanford University. And that, 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 that discussion will be on April 12th at noon Pacific times. So feel free to join us then. And again, I wanna thank all three of you for uh, today's uh, discussion, which I think has been fascinating, absolutely fascinating.